Audioholics, we are live streaming today, August 31st at 11 p.m. Eastern Time. We have two guests with us, two guests to just talk about speakers. We have Matthew Pose and James Larson. How are you doing, my friends? We're good. Glad yeah. to be here. Yes, we are. Awesome. Well, you know, guys, we always get criticized on Audioholics for saying, you guys cover expensive gear. Do you guys ever look at budget gear? I don't have $10,000 to spend on a pair of speakers or $5,000 on an amplifier or $1,000 on cable. Oh, not cables. We're not about the expensive <laughs> cables. <laughs> but we no. do we do review some pretty expensive gear. I have to admit, we like playing with the fancy toys. But I think the real engineering, the real creative engineering, is when you can make a speaker that actually sounds good on a shoestring budget for basically less money than some of the guys on other magazines are paying for their cables. Oh yeah, that that's where it's at. I mean, that's it, it makes way more difference to way more people when you um, can bring good sound to uh, an affordable. You know, very very few people are spending five figures for a speaker, so it makes a much greater difference when you can make a good speaker for something that anyone can buy. So yeah, yeah, and yeah. and the nice thing about that guys is is if you if you wind the clocks back maybe 10, 15 years ago. It was really unheard of that you could get a, a pair of floor standing speakers for a couple of hundred bucks, at least ones that weren't like a white van special. You know, it was hard to get a speaker with a silk dome tweeter or what other than just a paper tweeter. It was hard to get a speaker that actually measured well, that actually had, you know, good dispersion characteristics uh, for $200 a pair or one that would even play at a decent volume level for it to be considered uh, being worthy of being a floor stander. So it's nice now with the advent of the internet and Amazon and all these internet direct companies coming out and, and the competition being fierce that we actually can look at speakers at $200 a pair and say, you know what? These are not bad speakers. And it's not just because of the price. It's just because they're a decent speaker. And of course, there's always limitations when you're buying cheap speakers or inexpensive speakers. Two things you're always going to give up. You're going to give up uh, bass and you're going to give or low end extension, I, I should say, you're going to give up low end extension and you're going to give up ultimate output. So none of the speakers that we're talking about today are going to shake a large room. You know, if you have a big upscale home theater, they're not going to have the power of a JTR and they're not going to have the refinement of a Revel. So let's just keep this in perspective. Would you guys yeah. agree with that? No, you're absolutely right. When you when you get down in price, you have to make certain compromises. And and I think the first most sensible compromise tends to be that the speakers themselves are not capable of the same kind of output as a higher end speaker would. You have to have smaller motors on the drivers. The crossover parts tend to have to be smaller and cheaper. The tweeters are smaller and cheaper. And all of that leads to an inability to play as loud. But I, I got to say, we were listening to these speakers just before this video, just to get a good sense of how they sound so we can talk about them. Now, James, of course, spent quite a bit more time on his own, but uh, we were one of the things we did right before going live was to try to see how loud we could play certain songs that we were familiar with that were very dynamic. They, I, they were shockingly, you could play them really loud, right? I mean, I, I can't imagine someone complaining about the lack of volume on these. I think what we decided was probably home theater. They might not get quite loud enough in a, in a big room, but for music at least, they actually surprised me. Yeah. Well, one, well, one more James. thing I want to add. add um, well, for people who are on a budget, let, let's say you, you, you don't have like, you know, a, a large sum of money to spend on speakers. And yeah, well, giving up output or headroom is uh, the most logical choice because uh, someone who is on a tight budget is probably not in a really large place anyway. There might be in like a dorm they might be in a bedroom. They're not buying speakers for a huge, like open floor plan, you know, great room or anything like that. So why, you know, so it makes more sense. Um, if you have a, a small budget, you probably have a small living space too. So yeah, it makes sense to have um, cut corners there, you know, on, on, on max, max headroom. Yeah. Now, I do think we have to add though that there are compromises made in the crossover, which often lead, and, and the drivers, which often lead to coloration. So while there's no denying that the speakers tend to be uh, unable to play as loud, not have as deep bass, to suggest that they're just as neutral as the best speakers for any amount of money, mm -hmm. that's probably going too far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, you got, you know, there's always compromises in engineering. And when you get down to this level, every nickel and every dime and every dollar counts because we're not focusing on aesthetics or brand appeal at this level. We're focusing on getting the bare minimum performance into these parts to make them presentable audibly and to make them measure, you know, reasonably well. So there are a number of speakers at $200 a pair on Amazon. Um, one of the ones that I was looking at that we haven't checked out yet was the Sony core speakers. I think they've gotten very good reviews on Amazon and in the press in general. And James, I'm probably going to have a pair of those sent to you in the near future, because I'm curious about how they did their tweeter arrangement. They have like a regular tweeter, then they have a super tweeter. So I'm kind of curious how those will perform in comparison to the speakers we're looking at today. And um, I guess what we should do is focus on the two models that you've recently reviewed is one is the mono price. And guys, forgive me, these model numbers suck. These guys, <laughs> these guys don't get it. They make these model numbers that you're never going to remember that I actually have to go into the review to look at. Mm -hmm. So the model price one we're looking at is the MP-T65RT. <laughs> and I guess they call it that because the 65 is a six and a half inch woofer and the RT is a ribbon. It's I'm it's sure. a mouthful, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a well. We got criticized for calling it a ribbon. It's a planar tweeter, or what used to be called back in like the seventies and eighties, a leaf tweeter. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to share the link here, guys. It's it's in here. Here's the link. I think I thought I I hit the wrong thing. Here we go. Um, you could go on our homepage, click on loudspeaker reviews, go to towers. It's there. So the first speaker we're going to talk about is the mono price. The second speaker we're going to talk about is the Dayton Audio. Again, a brilliant, a brilliant model number. It's the MK442T. <laughs> I guess that means because it has two four-inch drivers, a tweeter, and a transmission line enclosure. I'm going to share the link here. Yeah, I and don't know what your problem is, Gene. These are like the most sensible names I could oh, think of. God. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like it's like alpha numeric soup, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's the date and audio. So um, I think we should just break down each model and then you could kind of go over the pros and cons of each. I'm going to switch my screen over so you guys can see what I'm seeing. And then James, you could kind of pick it up. Um, if you want to talk about the measurements and stuff like that. Let me see, share my screen. Now, um, let's go over the price and everything too. Let me get into this. So the first one, can you guys see my screen okay? Yeah, we yes. see it. Okay, so this is actually interesting. This is the least expensive tower speaker I think Audioholics has ever reviewed. Yeah, these are, okay, $140 a pair. Is that, was it $140 a pair? Is that what it says there? With free shipping. So like that's $70 per speaker for a yeah. tower speaker. Granted, it's a very small tower speaker um yeah whoever buys these needs to get some egg crates yeah or milk milk, milk crates. Yeah, they're crates. Only, milk crates. They're, they look big in the picture but they're only 30 inches tall so you definitely need to put them you need to prop them up because if you're sitting down you, that tweeter is going to be like on your knee much like too knee, low knee yeah knee level you know and, and it's an mtm design which means that there's some lobing if you're up in the vertical axis like that so we actually when we were listening to them um, we're noticing some issues with that and found that sitting on the floor was better. <laughs> I'm surprised to be honest with you that they didn't make this, a, you know, put the two woofers on the bottom, put the tweeter on the top because there's so much space between the woofers and the tweeter that it almost nullifies the advantage of doing an MTM. Well, I don't know. Maybe it looked cooler. It, it, the arrangement has its advantages. Um, and, and, and as you said, there's always going to be compromises. I, there, there are acoustic advantages to this sort of driver arrangement. Um, it, it, the tweeter is really low to the ground, but you could easily like prop it up, or or something. Or I think like like I I think I mentioned the, in the review, these would be great for like a, a kid's den, and they they're sitting on like bean bags or something like that, and they're priced accordingly too. So like yeah, they're they're fine speakers really for what they are. Oh, so to give you. So if the give, kids if the kids throw Jello at it or whatever, you're not gonna you're not gonna get too upset because they're only hundred and forty dollars a pair. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, and they have grills, so they're kind of protected. Or, or, well, and you couldn't poke like you know. I remember as a kid, the big issue was kids poking the dome tweeters in, and you know, 
dads yelling at their kids for doing it. There's no dome tweeter to poke in. It's it's what relatively well protected. Yeah, you could poke in the dust cap. Yeah. Actually, Gene, Gene, um, to give it, people an idea of how small they are, we have them right here, and I can pick them up and show. Okay, our let viewers. me let me stop sharing. Okay, and I'm, let me show you. So okay, go ahead. Go ahead. And, and while he's grabbing this, I'll just mention, normally when James measures towers, they're heavy and big enough that he has to use a special rig. He actually <laughs> right. was able to stick this up on his bookshelf rig, like way up in the air. Yeah. That's how light and small they are. So you can see how, how big it is. I mean, let's see if we can like, 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 like this way. And it's not very heavy either. I mean, it's not. Yeah, it's yeah. what, it's about 20 pounds, I'm guessing. No, not even. It's not even 20 pounds. 17.5, 17.5. Yeah, so I, yeah. I, I think I weighed them, and I don't even think they measured that much, but... That must have been with packaging. Yeah, I was able to carry these, like, one under each arm kind of thing. Yeah, they're, they're pretty light. I mean, they're not the most, like, heavy-duty speaker. Yeah. We're ripping on them, but they're $70 in pair. 70 and, bucks. And, and they actually do have some really $70 good attributes. Each. Yeah, 70, 70 bucks. Oh, 70 bucks each. You're right. 40 a pair. Yeah, Seventy dollars yeah. a pair, that'd be a, a steal. Like they'd be losing money probably. So, yeah, real, so quick, real quick, I just wanted to pop up a question here. Someone says I have a Morant's uh, eighty twelve receiver, which is a great receiver. Would it be okay to hook something like this so cheap up to my amp? Yeah, your amp doesn't care if you're hooking up a uh, hundred forty dollar pair of speakers or a fourteen thousand dollar pair of speakers. I mean, they're these are a pretty benign load to drive, aren't they, James? They are, but they don't handle that much power. So yeah. you can hook them up to any amp, of course, but you just have to be careful how how hard you drive them with like a powerful amp. I I I, I what what's the uh, they're rated for max max power sixty watts. So what well, is that? Maybe. But RMS? you don't know how you don't know how they're rating that either. It all depends on the duty cycle of how they rate power. You know. Yeah. Sure, but it wouldn't. I don't think it would take a whole lot to blow to destroy the speakers i mean not a whole <laughs> lot they're actually not that they do play pretty loud they're not too bad for that right but still i mean are you really going to hook these up to like what a marantz what was it what was the model number the 8012 12. i would not personally use these as a main speaker for a receiver of that caliber but yeah. if, you, if you went and bought it's not a problem. Then, yeah it's not a problem but if you went and bought I'm guessing if you went and bought a $300 Akio or a Denon receiver, this would be a good speaker to use with that. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's that. And, and like, you're going to end up powering these with an amplifier that's commensurate with the, how much power they can actually handle. Right. So. Yeah. But we shouldn't go nuts here. I mean, that 8012, I, I haven't seen actual measurements on it, but knowing how past Marantz have performed, I would guess the best case scenario is it's maybe doing twice the power handling of this. And the likelihood that anybody would actually manage to drive that thing to that point with these is pretty low. I mean, I think under most conditions, somebody would notice if they had actually started to overload it that much. And not only that, if you're buying the speaker in a home theater environment, I would be base managing them anyways and using yeah. a powered subwoofer. So take some of the load off of that because those drivers are not high excursion drivers to begin with. So no. you, yeah. But I will say, I was impressed with how much bass those little tiny towers put out. When we hooked them up, James' first comment to me was, do you have a subwoofer hooked up? And I actually had to go double check to make sure there wasn't anything hooked up, but I, I didn't. It was just those speakers. So let's go over some of the measurements. I'm going to um, stop showing you. And bear with me. I'm getting used to this. But uh, let's share my screen here. Entire screen. Bop. Can you guys see my screen again? We're back on the review. Yes. Yep. Okay. So guys, everybody that's watching, please take a look at these reviews. James Larson, like he's very meticulous and you choosing every word he wants in his reviews. He spends a lot of time crafting these reviews. So please uh, pander to him and read his reviews because they are worth reading. There's a lot of good detail on the design of these speakers. He puts a lot of effort. He even takes all of this stuff apart so you can see the insides. You can see the drivers here, stamp baskets. Here's the uh, AMT tweeter or ribbon tweeter, whatever you want to call it. Is that a capacitor on the woofer? Is that all it's got? Yep, that's the that's the crossover. Oh the my cap. <laughs> that reminds me of my Axiom outdoor speakers I had. That All they had on them was a capacitor on the tweeter. and it, I'm sorry, a yeah, resistor and a capacitor on the tweeter, and they ran the woofer full range. But those were four hundred dollars speakers. These are one hundred forty dollars a pair. Yeah, the crossovers are very simple on these, which is what you probably expect for the price. But at the same time, it works, right? 
Well, I, I would like to say something. Um, the woofers on these are actually really well. Um, they're damped from going into like breakup modes, right? So their breakup modes are not. I think they're using polypropylene. I think, and, and they, they don't. Like they don't. They don't. The breakup nodes aren't really obnoxious. I, I uh, measured just the woofer of uh, I think the bookshelf variants of these, and like I, I was surprised. It was really um had a really well controlled like breakup behavior, and you have to when you're running a, a woofer full range. So like yeah. these the woofers were engineered to to be used in a speaker exactly like this, and they they do a good job for what they do. You know. Right. I gotcha. Gene, you recently did a, a YouTube video where you were discussing different cone materials and what effect it has on sound. Right. And and one of the things, forgetting sound for a minute, just in terms of like, does, I don't know, polypropylene sound better than carbon fiber, forget that. One of the things is that the dampening of the material can affect the se severity of that breakup mode, which tends to ring too over time. And interestingly enough, regular old uh, like coated paper and polypropylene, especially when it's got like a rubber surround, are very well damped. So they don't tend to have bad uh, uh, breakup modes. But, you know, we've gotten so into fancy materials with really, really stiff, poorly damped cones that we're kind of used to speakers that do actually have very, very severe, prominent breakup modes, which requires really, really high quality complex crossovers. Because this is such a cheap woofer, and I think the woofer's inductance ended up being relatively high, if I recall, too. It really had like kind of a flat response, which mm. uh, you know I think is it, it, part of it's because it's cheap, and part of it is actually because it, it works well in this case. Yeah, so it's self-damped. It has a high inductance, so right. it actually filters itself off at high frequencies. So yeah, yeah. In a case like this, a simple crossover or no crossover could work. But if you take a regular stiff driver, aluminum cone driver that isn't properly damped, and try to do a yeah. crossover, you're asking for trouble. It's going to ring like a bell. Right. Yeah. So it, it worked here, basically. I mean, they were they took advantage of the fact that it was cheap and just engineered it. I mean, you were saying earlier, like some in some ways, some of the hardest engineering to do is making a good sounding cheap speaker. And that's kind of what's going on here. Like, how do you basically get rid of every part that you possibly can and still have it sound good? And that includes in the speaker driver design itself. Yep. Yep. So there you go, guys. This is bare bones minimum here. You know, it doesn't have any fancy uh, outputs or inputs here for the speaker <laughs> terminals. So you don't want to use 10 gauge speaker cable here. I would probably use 14 gauge at most. It'll actually take thick. So we were managed to get banana, like big, heavy banana plugs inside that terminal. So it would probably take 10 gauge if you wanted to. Oh, wow. And it didn't try to, like, sometimes if you try to put banana plugs in terminals like this, they break. Like I had a pair of JBL Pro 3s and <laughs> I tried to use bananas. I broke the terminals on them. So you got to be careful with that. Uh, the spring okay, modes. maybe for mono prices sake, then we don't recommend you do that. But for <laughs> us here listening, we were it able to shove us, banana yeah. plugs in there. I would I, personally I, say 14 gauge bare wire is all you need at the most. Sure, yeah, it works fine. Spring clips, they're cheap, but I like them. You know, yeah, I like I kind of like them better than like those like fancy big five way binding posts. You know. Gotcha. They're easier to use than, than big binding posts. So yeah, they can they can be for sure. They can be. I what G, uh, Gene was talking about has been my issue with them over the years, which is that they tend to break over time. Yeah. Oh, I guess the spring would wear out or something. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You got to be careful. So here's how James measures the speakers, just so you guys see. He actually built this platform here. He goes outside. This is how how many feet up is it again? Twelve. That feet? that is like seven and a half, I think, right there. For, for that particular measurement, you can see that that's when I was taking a vertical on the uh, measurements on the vertical axis for the speaker. So y you can see that um, that's not that's not like 11 feet. But when I um, when I measured this on the horizontal axis, I was able to get, I think, 11 foot an 11 foot distance off the ground with the speaker, which gives me really, really, um, you know, good uh, clearance from the ground. So I didn't get as much effect from ground bounce. Right. And um, it, it, I barely even needed to like, um, I mean, I, yeah, I, I windowed out the ground effect, but I still got a, a really good sense of how the speakers behave and even, even with the ground bounce effect. Cool. So yeah, we do this. He goes outside to do more accurate measurements than what you could do in your room. And here's, I guess, what we, what James wanted to break down the different measurements at various angles, just to show you on axis, this speaker has a lot of treble. So if you listen to the speaker on axis, you can see the elevator response above 10K. 
some well, people some people might like that. It depends on your hearing sensitivity. But go ahead, I'll let you talk, James. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a note um, for that that 10K. There's not even a lot of content on 10K, right? You're not going to find a lot of recordings with re, like real content up mm -hmm. there. So like, if the if you see like a rise at 10K, I don't regard that normally as like a big deal. You know, it's it'd be better if it were just flat, of course, right? But when you see like craziness at 10k or something, I don't really. And and you actually listen to the the speaker, it doesn't sound like much. It's it's not a very serious flaw. Like so, the 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 flaws in the speaker's response, I would I would say are, are more around uh, the upper mids there. Like, what is that? Um, from 2K. about yeah, from about 1.5k to about three and a half k. That's a very sensitive yeah. area for. Yeah, that's where you're right. gonna. That's that's what's going to have um, more, far more of an impact on on the sound of the speaker, and it, it's not obviously the frequency response here is not perfect. So this is the on-axis response. Would you say this is like the direct? You know, the speaker is aiming right at you, and that's that's the response. And um, it's not it's not obviously it's not perfect, but this is seventy dollar uh, seventy dollars a speaker, right? So it's not it, it's actually pretty listenable. Um, it, it's yeah. not. It's not terrible. This the, this response there is not terrible. But you, you know, broke the, up for. The, go ahead, Gene. Sorry. I was gonna say this might even be fixable with Odyssey. You know, because this two kilohertz notch here, it's you know this this kind of stuff can be can be kind of EQ'd out in uh, room correction to some extent. Sure. Well, but we're gonna look at more measurements, which will explain yeah. why the room correction it can be such a problem for this. So yeah, if yeah. that response okay. was stable across all the different angles, such that the direct and reflected sound you heard in the room all had the same tonal balance, what you said would be totally right. The problem with this speaker, but we treat it as a benefit in a way, <laughs> is that yeah. the response actually changes for the better as you get off axis. So, so now we're at 20 degrees off axis here. Yeah, so you'll see the shape should flatten out as we keep going more. Yeah, the, the, so the, yeah, you're going to 20. You can see there's a change. So there's that's is that zero 20, that's 20, and it's still you still a lot of rockiness. It's still imperfect. It's still colored, yeah. Yeah, it's not changed that much at 20. Uh, I think there's a. Let's see, here's 50 degrees. 50 degrees actually looks really good. Yeah, now it's flattening it out. Yeah, and no. this is like the the axis that we said was the preferred listening axis because it's so flat. But so the problem is, imagine if you actually reduced in Odyssey that raised mid-range area that that between one and a half and three and a half kilohertz. Right. You'd then have a dip here. Yeah. So like, okay. So the, so this speaker, uh, what we're what we're demonstrating now. So this is fifty. Can you go to like I think there's fifty five. I have there and sixty. Yes. So there's fifty five. It just gets flatter as you go off. I mean, that is a really good response, right? That's a really mm -hmm. good response. Wow. Look at speaker. that. Look at that. It's, it's sixty. It's ridiculous. This speaker so, is ridiculous. So basically what you need to do when you're listening to these speakers is tow them in more than you would ever think. So, you know, go, I actually have an app on my phone. See if I can pull this up while we're on here. But wouldn't towing them in put you more on axis with the tweeter? I mean, it depends on, I guess, how far away this. No, that's the, that's the point. You want to tow them in so aggressively or tow them out so aggressively. Tow them out, yeah. Out. That's you can I'm do thinking. either. Yeah. So I have this uh, app that I use and you you put this on top of the speaker like this and you click like which one you're going to do so so like i would have it at zero like this yeah, let me show you I, let me show you so you could show them yeah. sure so it looks like it might be a little overexposed yeah, yeah. I don't know if you can what's, see the that. Name, what's the name of the app it's called speaker angle i think it costs a couple dollars maybe if that it might be free even i think it costs a couple dollars but anyway the point is you you get that and then you put it on top of the speaker so that the front of the phone is flush to the front of the speaker cabinet, which you can't see my hand here. But anyway, um, then when you tow it in, it tells you the angle. It's pretty accurate, uh, you know, definitely good enough for, for what we're talking about doing here. And so the nice thing then is when you're trying to tow this in and we're saying go to 55 degrees, it lets you do it really quickly. Yeah, so I've got the speaker pointed right at the, the camera. So this would be like, if you're looking at it, that would be like zero degrees on an axis, right? Now, I'm going like a 50 degree angle might be something like that, right? And that's the angle you kind of want to listen to these at. Yeah, we can actually do with the app really quickly. That's crazy. Like the mids are completely off axis to you. You would think you would mess so up. Put it where, put response. it so it points to the. Okay. Yeah, let's just zero this out real quick. So I think this is like, like with a, go ahead. Okay, now that that's on axis. Now right. let's go right here. Where, where are we at? 
40 at for still only at 40 degrees. Yeah, 40 degrees. So now so that's 55 degrees right there. So that's how much the speaker had to turn from pointing at the camera to be at 55 degrees so that people understand how yeah. extreme this is. But at this angle, you're getting a really flat response. You're getting a very neutral response. So like it's this a crazy reminds me, this reminds me of the Bose concept, direct reflect. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and so we were talking earlier, do you tow out or do you tow in? Because you're basically, if you're towing in, you're practically pointing the speakers at each other. Like that's how how towed in they are. Um, and you might wonder, like, do they interfere with each other or not? Which it'd be interesting to measure and see. I don't know. If you tow out, the problem you've got is you're so towed out at that point that you've got possibly a lot of very high output coming at the wall. Yeah, you, know, you, you have a lot of very loud. reflections. Yeah. But you know, one thing you can do, and I get these are cheap speakers. People are only going to only going to go so far, but um, you know, if it's in a smaller room, you could always, you know, make some cheap acoustic uh, absorbers and actually place them where the speaker's pointing, so it's absorbing most of that reflection. Right. Somebody or, had a quick question about floor bounce because we keep talking about floor bounce. I'm going to put that up there so you guys, Matt, if you want to answer that real quick. Yeah. So floor bounce refers to the fact that the woofer uh, itself is usually off the ground by some amount. And the distance uh, basically between the woofer and the ground causes a reflection so that when the set, you have some sound that hits you directly, you have another pass of sound that's delayed from that, that hits the ground and comes at you. By the time it hits you, it's out of phase. And so what that causes is, is uh, interference. And actually the interference happens uh, by, right at the point where the speaker is sitting, if you will, so that you get that floor bounce effect everywhere that you sit. And when you move the, the woofer higher off the ground, the delay is greater. So the cancellation goes up uh, and becomes more extreme. And that's why uh, most, if you look at most tower down, speakers, sorry. most tower speakers, they do tend to put the bass drivers towards the bottom, you know, the bottom of the cabinet. Right. And the advantage of putting it closer to the ground is it removes the floor bounce effect. The negative is when the woofer is crossed too high and it's sitting too far away from the other. Like if it's a two-way speaker like this one, if that woofer was right on the ground, it'd be too far away from the tweeter and you wouldn't have good coherence basically between the drivers. The response wouldn't be good. Um, so you kind of have to figure out what you're doing. Two ways, you basically can't put the woofer on the floor. Three ways, four ways, then you can get it closer to the ground. Yeah. Well, let's continue on to the, um, I, I guess, a couple more measurements on this, and then we'll go over to the Dayton. And then we'll also talk about a surprise about how we can make the performance of these speakers actually better. And that's yeah, why we have Dennis Murphy is actually in, in chat with us. And he um, okay. he does uh, his own speakers from a company called Philharmonic, but he also does mods to crossovers for inexpensive speakers. He always lurks on the forums. He's always on our forums, for example. So he's a, 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 a great resource to have. Let me go back yeah. here. Can you see my uh, the measurement again, the 60 degree? Yeah, one? so mm -hmm. that's 60. And, and like, it, it's just crazy, the speaker. And I, one thing I want to add, this I think this is an accident. This I don't think that was an intentional. No. Yeah, the speakers have such, such a, <laughs> a really good off-axis response. It, it's, it's a happy accident. So like, um, so, you know, I, I found this when I was taking the measurements and, um, Jesus, even like, at 75 degrees, it's still yeah, pretty good. All the way out to 90, practically. This could and, be and a great, you realize this could be a great side surround speaker. Mm -hmm. You could cover, yeah, this, two, you could cover two rows of seating if you put this in the null. I think that they should actually chop the speaker, like make it like half as deep sealed cabinet wall mount, and then not as tall and it would make a good surround, good center channel. Yeah, so that's 90 degrees. And that's like not a bad, that's not, that wouldn't sound bad. It wouldn't sound perfect right there, right? It would be a little bit colored, but actually that's that's a really good response. All about, that's a right angle. You're, I mean, you're listening at a right angle to the speaker, right? And it's got a good response. Mm -hmm. Most speakers, no matter what the price, don't don't have a response that good out to an, out to that kind of angle. So that's, it's a really remarkable speaker actually. Um, so. I, we, we, for hundred and forty dollars. Yeah, four hundred or forty bucks. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's just crazy. And um, so I, I was thinking, it, it's it's not a, an expensive speaker. It's something you could kind of toy with. I I thought it would be a good like uh, platform or like a, a DIY project for speak people who want to like uh who like to tinker with things, who want to make things better, right? Now this would be a good thing, a good speaker to like um, just make better, right? So like I was thinking about it and I think, well, why not? What, what can we do to make the speaker better? So um, 
Actually, Dennis Murphy got in contact with us. Dennis Murphy, he, he ran Philharmonic when that was going. They made the great um, uh, BMR Philharmonics. He did a lot of yeah. the, the designs for Salk. I mean, he's a you know an ex a speaker designer extraordinaire, right? So mm -hmm. like um, he he got in contact with us with us, and he, we were just talking about it. And um, I was you know we, we just got to talking about how this can be improved. And um, I, I, I told him I was thinking about writing an article on the things you could do to make this simple, cheap mods you could do to the speaker to make it better. And um, he says, um, he, he started talking about a crossover and I and we, we made an arrangement where he actually designed a crossover for these speakers, which m makes it way better on axis and um, probably off axis too. And I, I don't know, I actually know how it affects the on, off axis response, but he got the on axis response really good. And uh, with a, a crossover that wasn't that expensive to put together. So like, we're gonna do a, an article like that and like uh, uh, how to mod these speakers, simple inexpensive things you could do to make these speakers better, right? And like, uh, and, and he, he's made the crossover design for us. And like, I'm, I'm looking at ways to like, to make the cabinet better because it's 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 a kind of a, a cheap um a little bit of a hollow cabinet right and and there's some simple cheap things you can do to make it like uh to stiffen it up and make it more inert right so, you, you see you take the speaker drivers out of the cabinet right you throw the cabinet in the garbage <laughs> <laughs> you start all over exactly well i, I think there's some simple cheap things you just could stuff do. it with foam at the top and bottom that should help or, or just yeah. just like rods just some no, bracing yeah. techniques or i would sand. suggest throw some sand in it <laughs> you could do that i don't it, it would dampen it probably uh, dampen it. it would probably not stiffen it a lot but what i was suggesting actually was you could take a dowel um and you could uh because you can usually do that front to back so you could take the dowel and you measure inside the cabinet the distance between the back uh, wall and the front baffle, and you cut uh, basically a bunch of sticks like that. And then what you do is you just put some glue on it and you you push it up into place. Stick you know, braces, clamp it, basically. That, make some that stick would braces. be that would do. I mean, it's a simple thing. It's just a small thing, but it would do a lot to reinforce the the, the panels, the side walls, and like um. Well, that would be front to back. You could do side to side, but it's trickier. See, so because the the only opening you have to work with is that six and a half inch opening for the woofer. It's not even quite six and a half. It's probably like five and three quarters or something. So what you'd have to do is cut. You can cut the same stick, but you got to cut angles on the side so that you can wedge it in and turn it. Actually, what I was thinking about doing was just like maybe cutting off the bottom panel of the speaker, and then um, moving and then throwing it away. Yeah, it's throw, throwing the well, not the speaker, but the bottom panel, and then making like a platform for this because this and make that, it taller. You can make yeah, it make it taller. Yeah, that's and, true. So there's there's I mean there, we're gonna I'm gonna throw out a whole bunch of ideas for these speakers. We're actually gonna mod them. I'm gonna measure them before and after the mods, right? And so that that's an article that'll happen hopefully sometime. I'm I'm guess guessing the late fall when I uh, when I'm done with a whole bunch of these reviews I ha I'm working on right now. So that's that's something we're going to do in the future. I think that'll be really neat. So if we do this and Dennis has that crossover all uh, rigged up for this design, where could somebody buy this crossover? Would they buy it directly from his website, or would they go on Amazon? Or well, how do we? It's how do something we get... you you would put together. I, I don't expect there's no way to get the crossover. You, you we we would put instructions on how to how to put the crossover together. So like okay yeah. So we could tell people the parts, the schematic. Uh, probably you could show them. From the schematic, how I was thinking we could make together. maybe maybe we could make a little YouTube video about how to put it together for people who don't know a whole lot about like uh, you know soldering and speaker design and stuff. Make it really simple that anybody could do who's just looking for a, a, a little project to do that's not expensive and and you can you could get you know a really good sound out of these for not a whole lot of money. You know, just be careful because if you do this, you're opening a Pandora's box to do to have both yourself committed to doing DIY for Audioholics, and then the people watching are going to be inspired and they're going to want to start building their own speakers. I'm telling you, this starts off as a little project. The next thing you know, you're making $5,000 DIY speakers. Well, you know, Gene, it, you're into cars, right? Yeah. There's, you can go out, you can buy a Ferrari, and it, you know, probably one of the best sports cars you could get for that much money, and it'd be really hard to modify a car to equal that. But isn't it more fun to go and buy something that's a third the price? Yes, but it's but, still, if you're driving a Ferrari at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what DIY <laughs> you do, man. No, I know. But, like the Ferrari's yeah. probably still better. In the case here, 
for what you might even spend on modifying this, you might end up with a better speaker just buying a better speaker. But there's something fun about taking this and hot rodding it, right? Right. So I think part of what makes the, the allure for the, the the YouTube viewers right now and for us to like get into this is that there's just something fun about finding a cheap speaker that isn't that bad and making it that much better. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. A, cha it's a great challenge. Yeah. And, and the speaker already has these peculiarly good properties. If you could keep those properties and then like uh, and uh, make the make everything else better, you could have a really good speaker. You could turn these into something special, I think. Uh, I, so suspect, like, I suspect when you fix the on axis response, the off axis will suffer a little. I, that's what I, I, suspect. I would have thought so, but I'm curious because sometimes what causes that change in on to off axis is related to the woofer's uh, response itself, especially if there's some break, like uh, breakup break modes. Yeah. So Dennis is on. Uh, he might be able to, to type something into the chat window to tell us when he measured it. If anything, he's doing with the crossover, address that, and if the response remained more consistent or if basically flattening the on axis kind of ruins the off axis. Yeah. Well, if we don't hear from him now, we could follow up with him on email and in the forums and then just put it in the chat here. Um, yeah. After the fact, I think what I want to do now is show everybody the second option, which is a little bit more expensive than the Dayton's. Or I'm the, sorry, the, but then the mono price. Mono price. That, that was a Freudian, from Dayton. That was a Freudian slip. Hold on a second. <laughs> they're from Dayton. Now they've got some advantages right off the bat. They're not so short, so they don't really need stands, which is nice. So these are the MK 442s. These are they're 228 a pair retail, but Amazon. We have a link here, so hopefully I'll link them up in the uh, YouTube video. These are two hundred dollars shipped, and they're based on a platform that's a very good platform on their bookshelf uh, version. I think what was the bookshelf? The four hundred twos or something? Or yeah, the MK four hundred twos. And then there's the M MTM one. Is the four four two? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, but the the we should mention the four hundred twos have been like basically replaced with the four hundred two Xs. Yeah. Yes. So, which is a crossover redesign to address what we had noticed basically everybody that reviewed them and noticed which was that they were pretty everybody. bright yeah they were yeah. they were not that totally neutral but they were a good speaker that was the thing that killed us was they were a good speaker if not for the fact that they were so bright they had some issues they're not perfect but that actually probably brings their tonal balance in line with these and the 442s more so Maybe. So, so this speaker Maybe. <laughs> This speaker actually has smaller woofers. They're four and a half inches as opposed to six inch, but they kind of look like they're higher excursion drivers. Like look at the oh, oh definitely yes the surrounds on them. But yeah. there's also there's also something unique in this speaker that the other ones don't have. Um, this little square box here. People look at that, they think it might be a port, but it's actually if I could find the picture here, it's a transmission line. So why don't you guys talk about what a transmission line is and why you would use it in a speaker? I don't know. I, why, what were they thinking? <laughs> what were they uh, thinking? Well, a transmission line has some advantages. Um, the, the way it loads the woofers, uh, it's a little bit more efficient. You can get a better response. Uh, but these... Uh, the, the transmission line design for these particulars, I don't think they pulled it off quite 100%. Yeah. Like it, it was not optimized, right, for a transition line response. So, like, um, it, it has its advantages. Some people think it's, like, it's a, it's a tighter sound than just porting a box. I don't know if I, I be, quite believe that. You're going to still get, a, like, a, a group delay out of a, a, a trans like a transmission line design but it's not it shouldn't be as severe in theory as that of a, a like a regular vented speaker um would you say there's less port chuffing in something like this than if they just would have put a port at the bottom yes definitely yeah. because uh, there's no bo the bottleneck is not for for, for the, the flow. uh yeah the, the well yeah the flow um is not as it's not as bottleneck you know there, it's not a small port it's a large yeah this is a big opening yeah yeah yeah. Uh, now, was there any polyfill inside that enclosure when you opened them up? Do you remember any damping of any sign? There should be. I think so, but I don't. I don't remember. Well, there's pictures. A... There's yeah, pictures there is. In the there is. You see yeah, it right okay. here. Yeah. There, there has to be because that's that's well, like a should... necessary component of any transmission line design. Yeah. Yes. Well, you don't have to put it in there, but it helps. It helps if you want to make it competently, you're going to have you're going to have to have that uh, lots of filling in there. Um, so these woofers have a pretty big motor structure for what they are. You know, that's a yeah, pretty si that, reasonable size magnet there. 
it's a relatively cheap woofer, but they actually designed it pretty nicely. And we talked about compromises earlier. So the neat thing about this driver is that it is a relatively robust four inch driver with more excursion than what you would see on a driver of this price. But the negative is that, oh, and I should also say the FS, the resonance frequency of the driver is, is very low for such a small driver. To achieve that, they had to make it heavy. So the negative is that the driver is very inefficient. And mm. what that meant was that bookshelf was really inefficient. I mean, it was like less than 80 decibels. With the, sing with the single tweeter. Uh, with, right. the single, with the single woofer. Single yeah. woofer. The, the dual woofer one was, was more manageable. It still wasn't a like real efficient speaker, but it was better. This one's that much better yet, right? Now, is this a weird camera angle? Are these identical? Because this one looks like it's a smaller motor, but they must. No, be those are the same. It's yeah. it's, it's an angled angled picture. I I, I kind of I think I think I, I took it at that angle to show, I get a better look inside the cabinet of how the cabinet is is formed. So no, right. yeah, sorry, yeah. So not, these not speakers these speakers are a little bit more money than the mono price. They're actually almost you know uh, about 60 like fifty percent more. 60, yeah, 50, 60 percent like more, but. They have some advantages. They actually have a real crossover in them. It's not just yeah. a uh, a tweeter uh, with a uh, electrolytic a cap. cap on it yeah. and a resistor. You actually have what is this? A second order crossover on it? I think so. I think they said it's something like the there's like a a third order electroacoustic um, filter. Oh, on the that's woofers? combined with the woofer. Yeah, the woofer. I, yeah, response. that's electroacoustic, so that's combined with the woofer's own, own slope. The original. Uh, bookshelf had like a first order on the woofer and second order on the tweeter. I recall, yep. or it might have been third first order. order. On the, yeah, third the, order high the, pass, second order low pass. That's yeah. I think they've upgraded to get that. Which th this speaker needed that, which is good that they've been able to do that. And they've done it with not a lot of parts, which is nice. Keeps the price down. I mean, I, I can tell you, we've been playing with these speakers. They're right here in my room right now. Yeah. The Dayton is a nicer speaker. You know, the construction me... quality is oh, better. Yeah. You know, I got it heavier. right here. <laughs> you can Here, see go it. ahead. I'll let you guys show it. Actually, I got, I got it down here, I think. Yeah, so it's a little bit, it's a beefier construction. It's a lot, you know, relatively a lot more expensive, like like 50% more. Um, But it's like, it's got a, a it's just a, a higher, more robust um, construction. There, It's it's a, it's like a, a thicker speaker with like, well, better components really. It, but it, it, it has no excuse not to be better because it's a lot more expensive, more, relatively yeah. speaking. Uh, just a, qu a quick interruption here. Dennis responded about the crossover change for the monoprice speaker. You can see his comment here. Yeah, twenty two dollars a pair for a, like a real crossover for those mono prices. It's like, I mean, that's it's just a great. It turns into a great little project. Yeah, yeah. we should and we well, should talk to monoprice about even maybe um, I don't know licensing this off of Dennis or whatever to offer an upgrade version of their speaker so yeah people can they buy can call it. They could they could add DM to the end of that ridiculous. Yeah, they, yeah. they could make it leave a longer model number. Actually, I think Audioholics needs a little credit, so it should be the DM Audioholics edition. Yeah. <laughs> so back to the date, and you can see the speaker does look like it's put together better. It's actually a more aesthetically pleasing looking speaker as well. It's yeah. taller, thinner. It it's, you know, it see, has some aesthetics. You can you know? see yeah. they've, they've done a little shaping here. You know, this kind of thing was originally done on speakers actually to reduce... Baffle diffraction. Ex right, the diffraction off the baffle. In this particular case, one of the things you can notice is that it's not big enough and it doesn't go down enough to actually make a big effect. So it's mostly for looks here. It's cosmetic, yeah. But, but it looks nice. It looks nice. I, I'm yeah, not complaining nice about that, you know, and especially at this price point to give any cons any kind of like... Anything to the aesthetics of the speaker at this price point is fine with me, you know. Well, I mean, James, I guess... you better, James, you better not blow out a bicep on those. Those are 26 pounds each. They're heavier than the model price. I know. Yeah, I got to be careful. Well, it's a two-man job to lift these for sure. So me and Matt have been like, <laughs> yeah, we, we need a dolly with this one. By two-man, you mean I carried one, then you carried one? Yeah, we, yeah well... Yeah, so it's not you know it's not a heavy heavy duty speaker, but for the price, it's really good. The, the all the parts are high quality. It's, yeah, yeah. It, it so is. Now, it's... So now let me throw this at you. I the I think the reason why Dayton came up with this speaker is they're they're targeting like an audiophile that wants to put this in a room, small room by itself, not in a home theater environment, because they try to get more bass extension out of it, right? But if you're going to set up a home theater. Would you still go with this speaker or would you go with the MK442 LCR and just use subs with that? Because now you've got the advantage of an MTM uh, as opposed to having um, a two-way 
or, or just two woofers like that with a tweeter on top, would you go with the MK442 with subs over this speaker if you were just going to do a home theater environment? Well, Gene, these look cooler. I know. They're they do look cooler. <laughs> well, if, if money is really tight, go with the 442s or, or the, the um, MTM ones. But these are a better speaker. It, they're their voice better. It's like I like the, I prefer. Well, I should say I prefer the sound of these more because okay. the M um, 442s they weren't as hot in the trouble as the 402s, but they were still a little. Um, they were still a little hot, and these just aren't at all. They're their voice more on the warm side. In fact, I would say it, it looks to me like Dayton kind of. Um, uh, overcompensated for some of the criticism that the 402s were getting and, and, and so like the, the tweeter on this one is voiced lower than the woofers whereas in the other ones the previous models the the tweeter was quite a bit hotter uh, and then the woofers so like um this is a warm sound it's a uh, very um it, it's easier on the ears um yeah. okay. it's it did sound really good though i was impressed uh with the sound now james always teases me because I tend to actually think like every speaker sounds bright. I like warmer sounding speakers, but I didn't feel any need to adjust the treble on these. I thought that they sounded good. Well, let's look at that. Let me, uh, let me share my screen again and we'll look at the measurements because we just looked at how the um, mono price speakers were a bit hot, especially in the mid range. Let's look at the Dayton audio here. Do you see my screen? Yep. So there's yeah. a transmission line enclosure again which has marginal benefits uh, for what they did here. Aren't you supposed to have with a transmission line or is it a quarter wavelength transmission line where the, um, the path between each woofer has to be equal distant from the opening? I don't think I'm so. I'm not an expert. I'm not an expert either. <laughs> I yeah, don't want sorry. To comment. Okay. Uh, actually, um, we got a response. I mean, you know, um, on our forums, uh, Dr. Mark Carter, who goes by the name TLS guy, he's very knowledgeable at t um, transmission line designs yeah. and he he took the he actually modeled the what would be needed because like the the transmission line part of this wasn't executed perfectly right i mean if you look at the base response there's some pipe resonances in there um and, and when we pull up the frequency response you can see that it doesn't sound that bad but it does make for an you can even see it in the polar map actually but sit yeah, there see like below like one kilohertz see, see you can see the, the the striations and low frequencies right those are like uh dips and peaks because of pipe resonances right uh, a transmission line a perfect transmission line doesn't have to have that so he modeled what the the kind of cabinet the size of the the line that this would the the woofers would need to really pull it off like really well and uh he found that the the cabinet would need to be like i think a third or uh, uh, um, 50% bigger or something. It would be, you need a significantly larger cabinet to have um, a, a, a better response there. Well, and that's always so, the case with transmission line speakers, which is why most of the industry doesn't make them anymore because they're, they have, you have yeah. to use a bigger cabinet. They're more complex to construct. And with the advent of power subwoofers, why do we need that anymore? Yeah. Well, in, in the old days, people were practically guessing how to design them. It was only in the last... 15 years or so that we got to a point where people could model them reliably to get good design. So a lot of the old ones were not well designed either. Yeah. But I think, you know, the other thing to, to, to point out with those resonances, those pipe resonances is that they're very high Q. So the audibility of them is not great. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, the they, notch, how sharp it is. Yeah. So, right. That's what high, for those who don't know, that's what high Q means. It means it's very narrow or sharp. Yeah. But if, if a peak is like narrow or sharp, that's a high Q. Um, like peak or null or whatever. Um, but w the, the thing to keep in mind about uh, nulls and peaks is that they're way more audible when they are the low Q when they're broad. So like, even if something's, uh, if you have a, a high Q null or peak, even if it's like really deep or really high, it's, it's still, still hard to hear if it's, a, if it's a high Q, but if it's even, if it's a modest like dip or rise, Meaning, um, or if it's a modestly, uh, if it's a low Q dip or rise, um, it, it's it's a lot easier to hear in any content. So like that's yeah. what you gotta look at is like big, wide. E even if it's not very high or low, that's gonna color the sound more than a high or low like sharp dip 
or or peak. And if I remember reading Floyd, Dr. Floyd Tool's book, if I remember correctly, um, I thought I remember reading him, him saying that you don't really hear high Q dips. You could hear the high Q peaks more than the high Q dips. So the yeah, dips, the dips are not as as worrisome as the peaks. Yeah. Yep. That's what he said, and that's true. And if you look at this, you'll see we've got these pipe resonances in the response. They're they're pretty high Q. They're probably not audible. On the other hand, if you look in the treble there in the range between, let's say, one kilohertz and three kilohertz, you see that there is kind of a broader peak in the on axis. It flattens a little bit off axis. That isn't as severe as those peaks and dips are that are the pipe resonances, but that actually would be more audible. That, that's going to characterize a speaker uh, exactly. much more than the uh, the narrow peaks and dips. And that, that would make the speaker have a little bit more of a higher presence to it. So are we seeing an elevated mid-range response in this speaker or like kind of like the monoprice, maybe not as severe, but like in around the 2,500 hertz range? Slightly. Yeah, slightly. it's not as severe, but it's definitely You've there. got to take it in, in proportion to the rest of the range. So the treble is not as high. You can see, like I said, the It's the a triggered... laid back sound. You can see that. Yeah. Like, yeah. And also, if you, you, you mean to get a sense of the bass response, you have to squint when the response is that rocky, right? But it, it's kind of almost on the same level as that like mid-range response. So like, it's hard to say with this speaker, given the context, uh, how much of that mid-range, like kind of like mild bump would stick out. It would it would characterize the speaker, but how much, I, I don't, I, 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 I'm hesitant to say it's like some kind of big flaw. I think it, I, I didn't hear anything really amiss in that region or some or off or anything like that. I think they sounded fine. Yeah, I think the point we were just making is that that would that characterizes the sound that that you would hear, even though those much more severe resonances. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can. Yeah, but you so, know, I think. Go ahead. Sorry, Gene. Oh, I was gonna say. So, looking at this waterfall, basically, and how the speaker responds on and off axis, what kind of um, positioning recommendations do you guys recommend? Does this, does the listener listen on axis? You don't have to tow it in ninety degrees like you did with the monoprice speaker, obviously, right? No, definitely not. No, I, this is one for me. You listen to with the speaker aimed at you because, like, otherwise you can see in the upper treble, it doesn't take long. It rolls off very sharply. Yeah, so you're you're just gonna lose, and and it doesn't. You don't really gain much by going off axis. It doesn't really get smoother, right? But it just loses high trouble. So this is one you want to listen to on axis. Yeah. And this tweeter, while really not that bad, it's a nice tweeter. It does beam a little bit at the highest frequency. So aiming the speaker at you does make sure you're getting the best, uh, uh, maximizing the bandwidth of the speaker, getting the best high frequency response. Gotcha. Now is, uh, are you guys planning on any mods on this speaker too, or do you think it's good enough for what it is? I wouldn't bother. No, there's no mods. Uh, I guess if you're really, you know, really on a, a project, you could do what a TLS guy did, and like he modeled the the cabinet, you know, needed for like a proper like um, a, a, a transmission line design, and like you could you could make the you can make a whole new cabinet for it that has that because the, he's you know he, he found that the the drivers actually worked well in a transmission line, and not every driver does. So like you could put these in a, a a better transmission line cabinet, that would be a significant project though. That would be you know that's not I, I, not a simple little like crossover design or a little brace. You're better off at that point. You're better off doing a kit, Parts Express, or they they offer kits like that. I would imagine. Yeah, I mean one thing you could play around with is you could try different stuffings of different densities inside to damp the resonances it's possible that if you get rid of those those pipes resonances. yeah you might find that if you place the material in different parts of the line with and use different types fiberglass there's some cotton damping material foam things like that reticulated foam like 30 ppi reticulated foam was a good one for this purpose it's possible that if you get it in the right location and enough of it that you might actually get rid of some of those and make it better and the cost of that wouldn't be high um the, the key is you'd have to be able to take measurements to make sure you're doing something. About yeah. It. Yeah. You know, just, just if you, if you don't really take speaker measurements, just getting to the point where you can take good speaker measurements would be a major project in and of itself. Yeah. yeah. So it's not, yeah, don't, don't bother. And we didn't play around with that. I mean, I suppose we could, but you know, so we couldn't really even tell you what to try and how much, but I will say we, we've set them up. You've listened to them. I listened to them. I think there was only one song of, I don't know, 50 songs where we said, we think we might be hearing the effect of the resonance. 
Yeah. And even that wasn't certain. I had to throw a pair of headphones on even to be able to say, yeah, something's amiss. Yeah. So if you want to recap what we were talking about between these two speakers, um, just to put things into perspective, if you guys are looking for a speaker that, you know, has decent sound, basically would fill a wide listening area because you don't have to listen to the speaker on access. If you want to put a speaker in your garage or you want to put it in a playroom for the kids, the model price is just a no brainer. The MPT 65 RT. T 65 RT. <laughs> whatever, <laughs> whatever. That is a no brainer. You could pick up a pair of those. You don't have to worry about if someone puts a drink on top of it or if, or if a kid throws an egg at it or whatever, that actually might uh, tame the response of the treble a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but that is really a great little speaker to use in a non-critical environment. And if you want to listen, especially off access, but if you want to be a little bit more serious, you want a little bit more of a refined sound, maybe setting up a home theater type of environment. Um, it seems like the date and audio is the better option, even though it's a little bit more money because then you could get a matching center channel. You could get the 442 as a center. You could get the 402s for the rears. And then you pick up a couple of subs and you're good to go for a very inexpensive amount of money. You could have a, a, a home theater system that rivals a sound bar, certainly. Oh, yeah. I mean, this, yeah, well, yeah, there's no a sound bars. It's not, it's left in the dust compared to these things. I mean, yeah, it, it would rival actually even some other, co I mean, like you were saying earlier, 10, 20 years ago, you couldn't get good speakers this cheap. This, I feel like this speaker specifically is so much better than what you used to be able to get, especially 20 years ago, but even 10 years ago that a home theater built around this would be su substantially better than a lot of the cheap stuff. Like those home theater in a boxes, for instance, I don't think any of them would compete with this. No, they're not, not even close. No, um, and, and definitely if you've got something that's like 20 years old and was on the low end price point, this probably yeah, would be It's not too. even close. Yeah. I can yeah. tell you when I was in high school and I went to like the, the stereo shops of the time, which were like the Circuit Cities and McDuff's, for 200 bucks a pair, the only thing I could get on sale would be like a pair of Silver and Vegas with a 10 inch woofer and a, and a horn. And they had more bass than <laughs> these speakers, but I guarantee you they didn't have the refinement, especially of the Dayton audios. Yeah, oh, yeah. So these are like, these are like, they, they sound good, you know? Um, they do. For, for going back to the MPT 65 RTs, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> um, I think they're so cheap. Let's say, and so are these. I think, okay, we've got a lot of these audio files. We'll spend thousands of dollars on this little component, that tweak. Um, are, are just people who are really heavily invested in audio to, to get everything perfect. I think these are, are interesting speakers to like, um, just, I mean, they cost less than your cable. They probably cost less than your cable tip if you're some audiophile who, who, who throws a lot of money at your system. But th then just listen to them, and like, how much better is your system? Like, is it really, you know, uh, it, it it calls into the question like, where, where does diminishing returns set in? You know, because mm -hmm. these we were just listening to these; these sound really good. You know, they they can't get as loud as as some other speakers, but if you're not going to blow your eardrums out, um, you could just enjoy whatever. You know any song on them um it, it doesn't have really really deep bass um so it's like uh it, it, it's almost it almost I, I would just say these are a good challenge for speaker for for like audio files if, if they want to be honest with themselves just buy these they cost like less than a fancy dinner and and ask themselves how much better is their system than these really how much better these really sound you know yeah, yeah. Uh, you could spend more money on a better sounding system, but you're spending many, many, many times this the um, amount of money for something that doesn't scale in a in an improvement along with the price. You know, so so I think audio files are just pick one of these things off just to get a sense of you know the d diminishing returns of their investment and in their and their audio equipment. Yeah, you know, that's, and that's a good challenge. I think uh, what we should do is we should have, you guys should participate in our forums, go on our loudspeaker forums, anybody that's watching now. And I want to see your budget solutions. I want to see you guys take pictures of any setups that you have. I don't want to see $10,000 speakers. 
I want to see you go into our loudspeaker forum and say, hey, I got these speakers. They cost me $80 a pair, even if I bought them at Goodwill or whatever. And here's how I have my setup. And here's, you know, here's my results. Because I think it's a great idea not only to look for budget speakers, but just to see what kind of deals you can get even on the used market and kind of have like a competition on our forum to see what the <laughs> best speaker you can get for the least amount of money. I think that would be real interesting to see. Well, you know, one more point, though, is um, while we're talking about getting the most for your money or, or, or audio files on like a really sh a shoestring budget, is that, well, we see a lot of really nice systems. One thing that just makes such a big, huge improvement is just setting your speakers up right, right? Yeah. Just just set up. Just, just set up will make such a big difference that you could have some like modest speakers like these sound much better than like a ten thousand dollar speaker if the ten thousand dollar speaker isn't set up right you know so these set up right is better than a much more expensive system that's not set up correctly so there, there's that too or a yeah. speaker that's put in a room with tile floors and glass doors and sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah well and i often i mean gene you you know that i've kind of even railed against this it, is you get more expensive, typically one of the things that happens is you get more complex. And when things get more complex, they become harder to set up. And so one of the most common upgrades people make early in a system is they add a subwoofer. Mm -hmm. And when that subwoofer is integrated improperly, the sound of the system can be highly compromised. I mean, it just doesn't sound good. And I, I very often see people, they just throw the speakers right up against the wall, point Sub in the straight corner. to the right. Mm -hmm. The subwoofer is just wherever it'll fit, under the couch or something. And, you know, they don't necessarily understand how to set it up. So they didn't take the time and you listen to it and it's like, eh, it, you know, it needs some work. You pull the speakers out a little bit, you tow them properly, you move the subwoofer to an optimal placement, you adjust the crossover, you get the time alignment right. And all of a sudden you've got a system that sounds really good. And I've done this for people and had them look at me and be like, that was a bigger upgrade than like changing components out in my system. So yeah. I, I think people need to make sure they do that. But the, the nice thing about these budget systems, it's, it's one of the things that I always puts a smile on my face when this happens is that because they're so simple and so easy to set up, you often get really good sound with just, you know, half an hour at most of good setup time. Yep. Well, we're going to keep looking for these kind of deals. We're going to, uh, you know, I'll scour Amazon and see what the most popular models are. And maybe we can line up some more reviews. Like I said, that Sony core model is, I've always been wondering about that for the last couple of years. I've been seeing all the great reviews on and there's some other models. Uh, there's a company called Mica, I think, that makes mm -hmm. bookshelf, bookshelf speakers that are in the price range of the Dayton's. Of course, James, you're um, reviewing the new RSL system. That's a little bit more upscale, but that's actually a pretty good value for the dollar we found from some of their past products. So we are going to cover all spectrums, my friends. I, um, I'm going to be covering, we're going to be covering the low end, and we're also going to be covering eight foot, you know, Twenty thousand dollar RBH speakers pretty soon too. So we, <laughs> you know, we get you know, both Gene, sides. Gene, you can cover the eight foot speakers. I need to give my back a break. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, Gene, I want to see the tower you put those up on to measure them. Oh my god, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta orbit those in space. Uh, yeah. yeah. When, when RBH comes out with them uh, to your house, I want, I want to see them get those up on a ladder and measure. <laughs> that's gonna be fun. I'll put them on my roof. Uh, well. I think uh, I think that wraps this up. I think uh, we've answered most of the major questions related to this thread. Um, guys, if you like this video, please thumb it up, subscribe so you get notifications on when we're going to go live next. In fact, I'm probably going to be going live tomorrow. I have a surprise about uh, Adobe Atmos stuff tomorrow that I'm going to be going live with someone in Germany on. So stay tuned for that around the same time as what we're broadcasting tonight. Uh, guys, don't forget about our Patreon channel, patreon.com slash audioholics. Please become a member. You get some access to content before the rest of the guys on Audioholics do, and you get some other perks as well. So thanks, guys, uh, James and Matt, for being here. Appreciate your contributions here. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.